Okay, I think we're ready to start. Um, hello and welcome uh, everyone to our uh, transatlantic conversation on artificial intelligence in medicine and um, healthcare. Uh, my name is Peter Rosenbaum and I am the executive director of the University Alliance Ruhr, a consortium of three German universities, Ruhr University Bochum, TU Dortmund University and the University of Duisburg-Essen. Let me quickly introduce and thank all of the other organizers of today's event. They are the Hasso Plattner Institute, uh, New York, and its director, Joanne Halpern, the Consulate General of Germany in Boston, and Lucius Lichter, the science liaison at the consulate in Boston, the German embassy in Ottawa, Canada, and its head of the science section, Ulrike Moshtagi, and last but not least, the German Center for Research and Innovation, the DVEH, with Julia Helms, Christian Masso, Jared Johnson, and Ben Brisch. So thank you all of you, and thanks to all of our speakers who took the time to be with us today and share some of their research. A few uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, you may post your questions and comments by using the Q&A function on your screen. You may also raise your hand. Uh, if we don't get all of your questions by the end of our event, please feel free to send us your questions via email to office at uaruhr.de and we will make sure to forward your message to our speakers. We're also going to live stream. We are live streaming the event on our YouTube channel. This would be the YouTube channel of the University Alliance Ruhr. So if we miss something or so if you miss something or lose your connection, you will have the opportunity to watch the event at a later point. Now it's my honor to introduce Ambassador, the Ambassador of Germany to Canada, Sabine Sparwasser. Ambassador Sparwasser has been the German Ambassador to Canada since 2017. Her previous posts include the German EC representation in Brussels, the German embassies in London and San Jose, and she also served as the Consul General in Toronto. Before coming to Canada, Ambassador Sparwasser was Assistant Deputy Minister for Africa, Asia, Latin America, Near and Middle East, and also Germany's Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. Ambassador Sparwasser, thank you so much for being with us. The floor is yours. Hopefully. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Professor Rosenbaum. My CV is getting way too long these days. Welcome to participants from both sides of the Atlantic, from Germany, from Canada, and from the US. Um, every day today, we see a new breakthrough in medicine. Artificial intelligence has really changed the game. We progress today in giant leaps. Um, and we just had this week's news from the UK. And it's mind boggling even to amateurs like me. Artificial intelligence has solved one of biology's grand challenges, predicting how proteins curl up into the 3D shapes that allow them to carry out life's tasks. That was apparently one of those riddles scientists did not expect to solve in a lifetime, but DeepMind could do it. The consequences and the potential uses are huge. Amongst other things, this may dramatically speed up the creation of new medications. In the US, MIT, to be precise, AI recently helped discover brand new antibiotics. They're effective against a whole range of very resistant bacteria that had worried doctors in hospitals for a long time. AI checked out data of 107 million potential candidates and then found nine that would work. The big brain project, Highball, between McGill University in Montreal and Forschungszentrum Jülich in Bavaria are co-developing the latest AI and high-performing computing for building extremely accurate 3D brain models, which is a bit like mapping a totally unknown planet. We are at the beginning of a transformative age. In medicine, machine learning will bring unheard of progress enormous benefits for our societies, for patients, and for healthcare uh, professionals. At the same time, in all transformations, it's the case, this does bring uncertainties, anxieties, and questions. Are algorithms soon going to be more important than doctors and nurses? 
Is machine medicine what the future holds? Is it ethical to rely on a machine when it comes to decisions of life or death? What happens with our data? Or can bias in algorithms actually create discrimination and lead to bad results? We want to hear about all of that from our excellent speakers today. Let me just close quickly by thanking all of them for being part of this conversation and all their institutions. A thank you to the Hasso Plattner Institute, the University Alliance Ruhr, the German Center for Research and Innovation in New York, as well as my colleagues in Boston and my team in Ottawa. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ambassador Sparwasser. And I'm turning it over to the head of the DAD, the German Academic Exchange Service in North America, Ben Brisch, who is also the director of the German Center for Research Innovation here in New York. Ben. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Peter. So, dear Madam Ambassador, dear colleagues Peter Rosenbaum and Joanne Halpern, dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Benedikt Brisch. I'm the director of the German Center for Research and Innovation. The German abbreviation is DWIH or DWIH here in New York. And it's my pleasure and honor to welcome you here on behalf of our center, which is hosting today's web talk. I want to thank our partners, the University of Alliance Ruhr, Liaison Office, of course, and the Hasso Plattner Institute, as well as the German Embassy Ottawa and the German Consulate General in Boston for their initiative and support to organize the, this transatlantic conversation. And I'd like to welcome, of course, and thank the participating distinguished as experts as panelists coming from medical, from excellent medical schools, from the University of Toronto, from the School of Medicine, Mount Sinai here in New York, from Harvard Medical School, and from the University of Duisburg Essen in Germany. Our center hosts and organizes around 30 events annually in North America. This year, due to the pandemic, of course, they were all virtual events since March, but we hope to return to on-site events in 2021, and we really look forward to meet with you, with our audience, and our partners and supporters in person again, hopefully soon. The German Center for Research and Innovation was established on the initiative of the German Federal Foreign Office, which is currently promoting five such centers worldwide in Sao Paulo, New Delhi, Moscow, Tokyo, and here in New York. We are very pleased to see that today's topic, artificial intelligence and healthcare, brings together scientists and innovators from Canada, the United States, and Germany to discuss how AI-powered technologies can use the massive amounts of data that are collected in, in the health system in order to improve health care and treatment for patients. At a time when the COVID-19 pandemic is challenging our health care systems and our societies, these questions are crucial for our future, and it is vital to, to discuss the opportunities, but also the risks of AI-based AI health care technology. Because any innovative technology, of course, and any health care advice will only work if patients and if the public have trust in it. I therefore see an important goal of today's discussion as contributing to a better understanding of AI technology and its potential in healthcare. So thank you to everybody for tuning in. I wish you an exciting web talk. And with this, I'd like to hand over to the moderator, Sarah Gerke. Let me introduce her briefly. She's a, Sarah Gerke is a research fellow for medicine, artificial intelligence, and law at the Petri Flom Center for Health Law, Health law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. Sarah's current research focuses on the ethical, ethical and legal, legal challenges for artificial intelligence and big data in the United States and Europe. Thanks so much for being our moderator and at our event. And I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And hi, everyone. So I'm very excited uh, that we will have a transatlantic conversation today on really this fascinating topic of AI in medicine and healthcare. And um, I have four fantastic speakers with me today, and I briefly uh, um, introduce uh, them to you. So the first speaker is Professor Dr. Birgit Ertel-Wagner, and Birgit is De Derek Harvard Nash Chair in Medical Imaging and Division Head of no Neuroradiology at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto in Canada. And she is also the Professor of Medical Imaging and Vice Chair um, uh, Research at the Department of Medical Imaging of the University of Toronto. Yes, um, absolutely. I'm just unmuting myself. I hope, I hope she can hear me. Perfect. Perfect. That's good. I'm glad. It's always it's the worst that can happen when 
technology failed you in those online meetings, but we've all been there. So don't worry, Sarah, I'm sure you'll be you'll be back in a second and we've all had that happen before. So I prepared a quick slide on the first question that Sarah was going to ask me was about um, AI is rapidly entering healthcare and how does it play out in medical imaging slash radiology? So my background is radiology and I, I give you my perspective. Radiology has a lot of different facets and a few years ago, there have been huge discussion about four or five years ago, huge discussions came up whether AI would replace uh, radiology in a very short time frame and we were called the coyote that's already over the cliff and just hasn't noticed it yet. Um, has anything changed in the last five years? Not really. All those methods, technologies have been relatively slow to really come into the clinical scenario. Um, but but to, to keep to the point of where is it starting to come into medical imaging, I want to walk you through those areas. First of all, I'm a strong believer we need a partnership. It's never the artificial intelligence in and by itself and cut loose. It's always human and machine working together, never completely dissolved. So in radiology, we, uh, we start from really having a long waiting list in almost all countries and almost all settings. We have more patients waiting for imaging than we can possibly do at a single time point. So we need some patient triaging, then image acquisition has to be optim optimized. We have to detect the patterns on the images and and make sense of it, interpret it, put it in the clinical context, communicate with the patient, with colleagues, and then in the end make treatment decisions and image guided treatments. So what are the areas where AI is currently starting to help us and where we're developing increasing help, increasing man-machine partnerships? It's waiting list priorizations, prioritizations. Let's find those patients uh, those patients that need imaging ur more urgent than others. Then in the field of image acquisition, we are working on sparse sampling. We're working on getting faster MR imaging. Most of you probably have had an MRI done of your knee, of your brain, or whatever you, you needed it for. And usually it takes quite a while, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, sometimes even much longer, depending on the indication. We want to change that with the help of, of AI to get down to, to minutes of, of whole, uh, whole imaging time. And we want to have lower doses on CT, on PET, on those methods, the methods that use ionizing uh, radiation. Detection tasks. Detection tasks are great for, for help by AI especially those that are tedious, that are fatiguing, where, where humans get really uh, tired, where humans need a lot of coffee to just really do it correctly, and those with a high caseload. Then we want to, uh, we are working on alerting of urgent findings. It's already working pretty well for intracerebral hemorrhage. We're currently working on an algorithm to detect brain herniation. And that's really saving lives. Basically, images come in at the scanner and it alerts you. You have to look at those images now. And one big topic and one very exciting topic in radiology, we want to see beyond what meets the eye. We want to detect things that we are unable to differentiate just by sheer visual analysis alone. And their AI algorithms can enormously help you to find the molecular information that underlies those tumors. And often it's really different molecular patterns within the same tumor. We're currently we're, uh, working on pediatric brain tumors, most common solid tumor in children, to find those molecular patterns in order to target a, the biopsy, but B, especially the therapy for those children. Genotype is encoded as an imaging phenotype, and what we really want is to decode the genotype based on imaging, and that's where we really need AI help, and that's where AI is being of huge help for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Can you hear? I hope everyone can hear me now. Uh, I'm, I apologize for this uh, technical problem. I don't know what happened. We checked it before, but that's 
in the world of big data, we still uh, have trouble to get this um, uh, done. But um, I'm just, uh, thank you so much, Birgit, for the um, uh, uh, answering the f uh, first of the questions. I will just uh, directly jump into the next question and then uh, also introduce um, a little bit uh, the speakers, because I assume you haven't heard any anything what I have said. Um, uh, so, um, my second question would be, um, will AI democratize medical knowledge and, uh, and expertise? And perhaps Marcus and uh, Thomas could say something about it. I will briefly uh, uh, introduce the two speakers. Um, so, Professor Dr. Marcus um, Herrmann, he is an interdisciplinary uh, physician scientist at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and where he directs the Division of Computational Pathology. And together with um, a team of software engineers and data scientists and clinicians, he focuses on the development of artificial intelligence solution uh, for digital pathology, as well as their clinical evaluation and integration into clinical workflow. So perhaps Marcus goes first. Yes, thank you very much. Um... So my name is Marcus Herman. I am a medical doctor by training, but did kind of like doctoral studies in the natural sciences in, in systems biology, worked as a data scientist for a couple of years, both on the radiology and the pathology side. And now um, I'm on the faculty at MGH, um, as Sarah said, directing a team of software engineers and, and data sciences. And our main motivation is making AI a a reality in healthcare. And when it comes to the question of whether that can ultimately be used to also democratize medical expertise and knowledge, I think it's a rather difficult question. I and I'd like to elaborate a little bit. So I think it will definitely challenge medical knowledge and expertise. I think what we already realize is that when we use algorithms and apply them to certain data that exclusively humans were able to analyze so far. We also sometimes see things that the algorithm has a different opinion about that kind of information when compared to the medical expert. So when these algorithms are trained on really large data sets, they may gain some experience that not every individual medical expert may have. So that may not necessarily apply to kind of like um, expert centers like the Mass General Hospital, but especially in kind of like areas where you don't have that bandwidth of all the different and maybe rare diseases, an algorithm that has seen hundreds or thousands or even millions of those can really have um, an experience that an individual physician may not have. Um, but ultimately, I think an algorithm that is more, and Birgit mentioned that as well, is more a decision support for medical experts that could, in principle, also be used by non-medical experts. And I think an example that we have seen there in the literature already is um, an application where you take a picture of a mole and the algorithm would kind of like tell you what, what the probability is that that may actually be a melanoma, like a, a dangerous skin cancer, or whether that is probably a lesion that, that is like not very malignant. The devil, however, is in the details. And I think the challenge will ultimately not necessarily be to kind of like use an algorithm and make it available to everyone, but how we interpret the results and integrate that into a clinical context. I think in most situations, it will not be that the algorithm will spit out a definite answer saying like, yes or no, do this or don't do this, like get, get treated for cancer or don't get treated, but it will output some information that will still require some medical expertise to interpret, um, to put it into clinical context, and probably also some technical knowledge to understand how the algorithm has actually been trained what data went into the training of the algorithm, what are some of the potential problems an algorithm like the, the one one is currently working with may, may have, um, what are potential artifacts, and, and so forth. So um, I think another aspect that is kind of like central to this is the liability and responsibility to all of that. So it's great if everyone can use an algorithm and the algorithm can predict something, but in medicine, often that can lead to relatively significant consequences, like somebody is being operated or not operated. And the question is, who will ultimately take the responsibility for those decisions that are purely based on an algorithm? So I think that is also something where 
despite that technology becoming available to non-medical experts, um, we'll probably need somebody in between who can interpret that and also take on the responsibility for making that decision that was potentially empowered and supported by AI, or maybe even driven by AI, but ultimately there needs to be a human in between at the interface between an algorithmic decision and a, a clinical decision that will lead to a certain type of therapy. And kind of like another aspect, I think, for the democratization is there currently the medical practice is kind of like a monopoly of medical doctors. And when this becomes more and more driven by technology, that may shift towards companies and engineers. And I think an interesting question that, especially from an ethics perspective, is kind of like, how are we going to deal with this? So at the moment, medical doctors take an Hippocratic oath and kind of like also help in situations where, I don't know, the patient may not be able to pay, for example. The question is like, how will this then apply to, to companies and, and to engineers if that is kind of like drifting more and more from uh, the medical domain into kind of like an engineering domain? Thank you very much. Um, um, Professor Dr. Thomas Fox, what do you think about it? So I, I just want to briefly also introduce Thomas uh, because I didn't have the chance before. Um, so he is a scientist in the field of computational pathology and focused on the use of artificial intelligence to analyze images of tissue samples to identify disease and recommend treatment and predict outcomes. And in October 2020, he has been appointed to the co-director of the Hasso Plattner Institute for Digital Health at Mount Sinai, and also Dean of Artificial Intelligence and Human Health, and Professor of Computational Pathology and Computer Science at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. So I would be very curious uh, about uh, your, your view, Thomas. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's great to be in on such a nice panel with uh, esteemed colleagues and, and ambassador. Um, let me take a, a very, very practical view on that and what we can do today. So there's this famous quote from, from William Gibson, often quoted, that says, the future is already here, but not evenly distributed. And that's, that's true nowhere more than in, in medicine. Uh, it's just fact that if you, for example, uh, have cancer, your treatment will be completely different if you can afford to go to one of the ivory towers like Mount Sinai, Slow and Kettering or Dana Fava than if you're in a, com in, in a community clinic somewhere uh, outside of these areas. And that's true without AI. Right? And the great potential I see for AI is that it can help to close the gap. Um, we demonstrated that in pathology, so we were able to build a system that's clinically great, uh, that finds also the smallest lesions of cancer, that really helps the urologist and the uh, patient in the diagnosis of that system. And then we evaluated it on 12,000 patients out of 800 institutions of 45 countries worldwide to test really the metal of that system. And when you uh, give that system to a community pathologist outside of these ivory towers, they, they are really enabled by these tools. Right? AI is not here to replace anybody. Uh, it's a tool like other tests, for example, a clinician would run. It helps them to find the small cancers, the early cancers at a time where the patient can still be treated. Um, and that, of course, has significant impact, not only on the physician, but especially the patient. And if you think one step further, uh, there are uh, uh, a lot of countries in the world where you, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, you have maybe one or two pathologists for the whole country. So there's absolutely not, not a chance in hell that you actually get meaningful treatment. But if you, for example, then, uh, mount your cell phone to a microscope uh, and run the AI in the cloud, you can provide information to the patient and the treatment and treating physicians you couldn't do before. So that's, I think, a, a good example how uh, AI can help with democratization of knowledge and expertise. Um, and also shows that, for example, in medicine, People are dying not because of AI, but because of the lack of AI. Um, and that's, of course, something we, we try to overcome within the frameworks and the conditions uh, 
uh, Herman and Brigitte mentioned so well to make sure that bias and equity and everything is regarded properly. But at the end of the day, I think we all have the chance to use these new tools to enable physicians to uh, do good and really push the boundaries of how we can help patients forward significantly. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to pick out uh, directly the problem of bias, which you just mentioned. And, uh, and uh, you know, AI has really huge potential uh, to transform healthcare uh, for the better, but at the same time, it also raises uh, some challenges, and one of uh, which is bias. And, and so my next question uh, would be for our first speaker, um, how, how biased are AI systems towards populations that, that do not frequent the very medical centers upon um, uh, whose data AI technologies are based? And um, I would like to introduce shortly um, our first speaker, Professor Dr. Sven Rahman. And Sven is a University Alliance Rural Professor um, for Bioinformatics and Chair of Genome Informatics at University of Duisburg Essen in Germany. And he is working on AI methods for precision oncology uh, within Collaborative Research Center 876 and Research Training Group 2535, um, both funded by the German um, Research Foundation. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm glad to be here. So I'm a mathematician by training, so um, maybe let's put this a bit into perspective. Um, AI in the media is somehow often presented as a very magical technology that will transform our lives, and, and I'm certain it will transform our lives in, in some way. But if you really drill down, it's just mathematical optimization. So it's really a way of optimizing a very, very complex function based on training data. So um, it, it, it is, at least not today, there is no real intelligence there anywhere. I mean, that's, call, that's why it's called artificial intelligence. Um, it is, everything we get is the result of um, mathematical optimization. So if you present such a system with enough training data and and you tend to need a lot of training data so for example let's say you want to do precision oncology you want to predict whether a tumor um, will lead to a to a very bad outcome or whether it is rather benign so you look at many many patients over the course of time and and maybe you sequence the genome and you look at the gene mutations and then you observe what happens to these people um, after certain therapies and and from all this data you build a model from which you will predict um, how future patients will fare and and what may be the best therapy but if you do this training on a certain subpopulation so on a very homogeneous population so let's say you only do this in germany for example so you will have a very limited set of people that are also genetically maybe not very homogeneous but but it's not uh, a worldwide um, uniform sample so of course the system has no chance of making good predictions for people it is not familiar with because simply there is no no training data in, in these populations and um, many people are worried about about bias and this is certainly a, a concern but i think uh, another big danger is that simply the system is not able to make a good pre prediction but is not robust enough or at least today many systems are not robust enough to safeguard against these cases where there's simply a lack of training data. So where it will simply say, sorry, I, I, I can't do anything here. And today's AI systems are very much limited in their capabilities of somehow choosing not to answer. So, so I think this is still um, an active research area and, and the systems will get ever better over the years. 
but but definitely um, bias and also the danger of making a prediction when not really sufficient data is available that that are valid concerns today especially since the application areas of ai systems are always very limited of, of limited scope and yeah so i think um this is also what is somehow limiting more applications in medicine today yeah, I think this is very helpful. I will, I'm also curious what Thomas uh, thinks because he already mentioned um, uh, before the bias. What do you, what do you think? What are the uh, biggest challenges, and how can we mitigate uh, biases? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, so again, to bring it back a little bit more into reality. So very often the concerns are brought up against the hypothetical straw man. Today, we live in a world where there's not a single AI cleared by the FDA for pathology. None, zero. There are dozens in, in radiology because it's uh, to some degree more screening technology, but in pathology, not a single one. So there's very, very strict regulation in place, regulation that is appropriate. It's a medical device. These things, again, are tests, it's a system, it's evaluated at the test, and the FDA looks very, very carefully uh, into how these systems perform under all kinds of circumstances. That's not only biased towards ethnicity, but especially how it works uh, in rare circumstances, in rare cases, how does it generalize uh, across the world? As I said before, uh, in, in the one example I brought, which, which led to the breakthrough designation of the FDA, was tested in 45 slides from 45 countries worldwide. So at the moment, we are not in a world where these things are run in practice. And regulation is very important. The worst thing that can happen is if uh, we would have a scenario where there would be hundreds of these uh, AI tools running around that some someone trained just under their desk on a subset of patients uh, as described before. And that would, of course, lead to all these worries we are discussing about and the disillusionment by the physicians and not the use of uh, uh, these tools by the physician. And lastly, of course, to mail practice and so forth, which is in, in Europe. So. So regulation is dramatically important, and it's it's done in a very meticulous, very, very uh, thorough way by the FDA. But that means at the moment, what we have to do as community is support the ones who actually build this thing. Right? The persons in the arena who fight to build something that helps patients, right? and not just tear them down, but build them up, and help them as good as we can, that all these um, uh, worries and um, rightful concerns are taken into account. But at the end of the day, there should be systems that help patients. There should be systems that help physicians. Uh, and that will lead to a, to a brighter future in medicine. Thank you. Um, I want to shift the topic a little bit because I think it's also very important um, the transition, really, what you also mentioned, uh, of research into practice. And how do we successfully integrate new AI technologies, such as medical imaging, into uh, the clinical workflow? I'm very curious what uh, Professor Dr. Birgit Ertel Wagner, who is, um, by the way, uh, because I didn't have the chance to introduce her properly before, uh, the Professor of Medical Imaging and Vice Chair Research at the Department of Medical Imaging of the University of Toronto. And I would be very curious what Birgit uh, can tell us about this uh, transnational um, approach. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, thanks for the question. And I absolutely agree with when we do need those algorithms and it, it shouldn't be a competition and it shouldn't be a fight over not developing them or uh, developing them. It should be it should be working together to make them work as, as best as they can and, and not to replace each other. So uh, 
I, I put a slide up on, on bridging the gap. And by bridging the gap, we had we had bridging the gap before, bridging the gap to underserved areas, which is very important and where AI can play a huge role. I'm talking about bridging the gap between research and clinical medicine. And there is a, a quite significant gap here. Um, I'm deputy editor for a large radiological journal, and we literally have thousands, and, and I mean thousands per year, submissions on AI in radiology. Which ones make it into clinical practice? You can count those on one hand per year. Um, so we have a huge gap, and there, there is a huge we could call it waste, but it might not be waste because it might lead to the building of different algorithms that in the end will make it. But we will definitely have to work on the translation into the clinical setting. And one hindrance of this translation is education. There's often a fundamental misunderstanding between the clinical uh, people on the one hand and the AI data scientists on the other hand. So we need to teach, in our case, radiologists, but that pertains to any, any part of medicine where AI is being introduced, fundamentals of AI, what it really means, how it works. Um, and we need to teach scientists fundamentals of clinical radiology to really show them where is our need and where might we have no need at all. Um, important aspect is access, accessibility, and there, there are um, a lot of different perspectives to accessibility, but one is accessibility in the clinical setting when we're talking about translation. We need to have an integrated workflow. In radiology, when we sit and we report our, our patients' images, we can't go to different system. It needs to be integrated into what we're doing in our daily, often very high volume workflow. We need to use a friendly interface. We need, and that's very important and probably my, my most important two, two points here. We need transparent results. We need to know what those assumptions are based on and how certain they are. And this goes with what Sven and Thomas have said before. When there's not enough data, we need to know. We need to know when those systems should not be used. And that's often not the case. Um, and the system should be continually learning. It should be getting our feedback, whether it was right or not. Otherwise, it might go really wrong. And very importantly, and it's been mentioned before, we need data governance and ethics principles. We need those to go into the future. Regulation, data governance, ethics, utmost importance to not go wrong here. So in summary, I think we need a human-centered AI in radiology, that's my specialty, but in every other medical specialty as well. It needs to be patient-centric. We want a personalized and precise medicine, a personalized and precise radiology. And it needs to be radiologist-centric, and you can replace radiologist with whichever other subspecialty. And AI is starting to play a role in every other subspecialty and specialty as well. It needs to be accessible, needs to be transparent. And in summary, I, I, I absolutely agree with this article by Murdahl. We should focus less on framing the research as a competition with human experts, like AI versus humans. And we should focus much more on how these tools can augment and assist humans in collaborative performance. And we both need to play a role in that, the human and the machine. Thank you. Sarah, I can't hear you. Sarah, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry, um, I unmuted, but something happened again. So uh, I hope you can hear me now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Okay. Um, yeah, so, um, so thank you so much, Birgit. I think um, it's, it's something very important what you just mentioned, especially the education point. I think it's very important that um, physician, et cetera, get trained what artificial intelligence actually is to being able to explain it also to their patients and 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 getting this transition and um, making this transition happening and especially also i feel sometimes we not only need the data governance and ethics but also um, um it's it's not about that the products are safe and effective but that we really need to make sure that they also um improve the patient outcomes i i would be very curious um what marcus thinks how can we uh best 
uh, make this transition of research into practice? Now, I think Thomas mentioned something very important. He said there are like no algorithms actually currently being approved by the FDA and used for primary diagnosis. And I think the point where we even struggle at the moment is not dealing with all the mistakes that AI makes, but even getting to the point of getting a result from AI and presenting it to somebody to evaluate. So I think if you look at hospitals, they don't necessarily have the data management and IT infrastructure needed to run artificial intelligence algorithm in real time on all the slides that are there. So there's a huge gap between what technology could in principle do and what we can do currently in practice. So a lot of the efforts in the hospital currently focus on even getting to the point of executing an algorithm and consuming the results and integrating it into a workflow in the clinic. And that in detail, that means like normally we get an algorithm that has been trained, has maybe been tested, that runs on a server somewhere. We need to get data, transform it into whatever representation the algorithm expects, feed it to the algorithm, get back the results, store that somewhere, present it to a user in the user interface, ask them for some kind of feedback of whether that's correct or incorrect, like potentially modify the result a little bit, verify it, save it again. And that entire chain is entirely complex and goes through like various hoops. And at a fundamental level, one of the problems I think is that we focus a lot on the algorithms in AI, but we forget that it's basically a data-driven technology. Um, so that has been mentioned already, I think by Sven, that the algorithms are trained with a lot of training data. But the same, of course, is true once you actually apply them. You need the data, you need to feed the data to the algorithm, and you need to consume the data that the algorithm produces. Um, and there are various problems with this. And there's kind of like this, this abbreviation called FAIR, which means that data, in order to be useful, needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And often that's not necessarily the case. So an image, for example, resides somewhere on some server it doesn't have a patient identifier attached to it. So in order to feed this to an algorithm and see whether a certain diagnosis would hold for a patient, we need to make sure that's actually the right image for the patient. We need to make sure we can read the underlying data, transform it in whatever way necessary, get it to the algorithm and so forth. So ultimately at the moment where we struggle with is the entire data management in order to get data to an algorithm, get data back from algorithm and use it in a meaningful way. And I think that is kind of like for the foreseeable future, what we kind of like need to focus on and kind of like on a side note, I also think and, and want to reiterate that I think AI is not only about the big question, right? Do I treat a patient or do I not treat a patient? But there are many smaller things that we are currently trying to do, for example, for quality control. You could imagine like the report says that it's a lung cancer, but the algorithm actually says that doesn't look like lung. Was there a mistake? Or kind of like before an, an image is already presented to a pathologist, you could do some quality control of whether the staining has worked and whether that image could even be evaluated by a human or an algorithm. So there are many steps where AI is tremendously useful in a clinical scenario without necessarily making the yes, no, treat, don't treat decisions. Thank you. Um, Thomas already mentioned a little bit also the challenges um, um, from uh, well, his challenges from a research perspective, but what are the challenges like for regulators or in general, the uh, regulatory aspects of AI? And I, I was wondering um, if Thomas can say a little bit more about uh, uh, the differences or commonalities um, um, as far as regulatory aspects of AI in medicine and health care in Canada, Germany and the US are concerned. Um. <laughs> happy to to some degree where where we have some knowledge about it um so we build systems that are ce marked in in europe and and uh, we build uh, software that's fda cleared and ai that that has uh, breakthrough designation uh, so as mentioned before my experience is that the regulatory bodies especially in the us are very diligent but very open and interested and invest an enormous amount of uh, time uh, to to make decisions uh, that that uh, ensure safety for patients. A lot of people, of course, uh, on the development side, get very impatient because that means it takes years to get the systems through clearance. 
uh, but it is a very, very important step. Um, we saw it a little bit in radiology, but uh, Birgit can certainly speak more to that. As soon as the agencies have more comfort with the new discipline, then clearances hopefully uh, will also go faster. Uh, the, the COVID pandemic certainly accelerated some aspects uh, of that work. Um, a big uh, impact of digitization in general in medicine is that some tasks, for example, in radiology and pathology, actually could be done remotely, which wasn't allowed, at least in the US until recently. Uh, and there are now clearances of systems and viewers that you can sign out from home. You can do pri primary sign out from home, which don't, doesn't put the pathologists at risk or the patients in the hospital. So there's there, if the regulatory bodies want, they can move very fast. Um, and all these endeavors are supported, of course, by a push on the AI side, because then you have the digital workflow Marcos was speaking about, where you then can insert these tools. So again, practically, and I think Sven spoke to that, most of the systems in medicine are, you can think of, of tests, like a like an immunohistochemistry test or like a blood test, you have a computational test. Uh, that delivers some outcome, for example, response to treatment or finds the cancer and so forth. And it's up to the physician to apply these tests. And as tests, they can be regulated the same way other tests are regulated. And the uh, companies who build these systems have to show that it's safe and effective. So to a large degree in medicine, there are already good frameworks to evaluate these systems. These are not AGIs or artificial general intelligence system that would, I don't know, converse with someone and come up with their uh, own hypothesis about something new. It's, it's like a, a test which is properly evaluated, but that does not undermine its impact in practice uh, for, for clinicians and the patients. But we are very much at the beginning of that revolution and the next years are going to be very exciting. Birgit, can you give us perhaps a little bit of insight um, um, in, in Canada? How, how are the regulatory, um, um, what kind of regulatory issues have we there? Or what, what do you have any insights? The Canadian perspective is very similar to the United States perspective. In Canada, it's Health Canada, it's a regulating body. And they usually follow the FDA very closely. It's a very close collaboration and it, it, it is very similar in many aspects. Um, and I agree with the other panelists, COVID has led to accelerations, but even with COVID, we have a very, very limited number of uh, approved and, and uh, approved systems. And in the end, there's always the responsibility part. And I saw a question in the question and answer box um, about, um, isn't it just like a lab test? You draw a lab value and then you make a decision, but it's infinitely more complex because a lab value, let's say you, you, you draw a hemoglobin value and there you can have a machine error. You, can, you have a certain number of things that can go wrong, but those are limited. In, let's say you have an imaging study of the brain with 5,000 images, um, a lot can go wrong and you can have a lot of incidental findings. It's often not only one question, is there a tumor or not, but you might have something completely unexpected and different that's life changing for the patient. So it becomes a problem that's much more complex. And in the end, there's always a responsibility thing. So it's usually one little part that's approved, but that needs to be put into the entire clinical context with the clinical responsibility lying with the MD. Thank you. Um, I have a question from the audience, which I uh, would like to ask. So. Um, what do panelists think about the AI's application in functional imaging data? And what's the solution for the relative uh, small sample size problem that is quite common in clinical uh, neuroimaging studies? So that's me again, functional neuroimaging, neuroimaging, that's, that's down my alley. Um, 
So the first question, yes, absolutely. It's going to play an ever increasing role because in functional rural imaging, we're talking about huge, huge, huge data sets, often acquired um, over time, looking for brain activation patterns, et cetera. Um, AI can absolutely help us in making more sense of this data. Um, again, always needs to be checked, always needs to be transparent, shouldn't get out of control. But absolutely, I see a very important role for AI in functional neural imaging. Second question, small sample size. Yes, absolutely, huge problem for us. <laughs> no question about it. And huge question for all the diseases that are not so common. One way to overcome this that many of us use, but that are also not always easy, is to use multicentric data and to have large collaborative groups to have larger uh, sample sizes. The other way or the additional way, that's one way that should be used wherever we can. And the other way is to to use transfer learning. And that's one thing we we've, we've been using increasingly is uh, transfer from data where we have larger data sets to data sets where we have small data sets. So we already have a pre-trained system. But again, always have to be cautious of, of what you're doing and that you understand what you're doing. Thank you, Birgit. I'm, I'm curious to hear from uh, Sven uh, um, what he thinks are like the next steps we need to take to ensure that AI is realizing its potential in medicine. Yeah, well, I, I think I could mostly repeat what uh, Markus has said previously. So, um, we need to go beyond the algorithms. We need to integrate them into clinical workflows. And, and for this, we need um, good user interfaces. So we need not only AI algorithms, but we need real systems that present data and that present results of AI algorithms to, let's say, to, to doctors at the right moment in, in the right context. And for this, we need data centers at hospitals. Um, the data needs to be able to talk to other data in a sense. Uh, this is sometimes uh, in conflict with data protection issues, uh, especially in Germany. And, and I think this, this is a huge task to get um, from let's say isolated systems and, and at the University Medicine in Essen, uh, we run lots of really isolated systems at the moment that, that cannot talk to each other to, to some integrated hospital-wide system where you can pull together data results, test results from different sources and, and view them in a, in a clinical context that makes sense to the to the doctor at, at the given moment and is useful for the patient. And this is exactly what we are going to do in, in the research training group that starts next year in, in Essen. So we are going to train 12 PhD students exactly uh, on this problem. So I think that's that's the most important thing that, that has to happen. Thank you, Sven. Um, uh, I just want to remind the uh, attendees, so please feel free to um, uh, write your uh, questions in the chat or, or you can also raise, um, use the raise your hand um, option and you can speak out your question loud. So I have another question from the audience, which is um, around uh, big data. So um, there are public data sets available online everywhere and they are private data being withheld by hospitals and research centers. And I wonder uh, if the panelists can comment on any differences in doing research using data from different sources. Any comments um, on data accessibility, any suggestions to other researchers working in AI, healthcare and medicine? I think okay. I maybe quickly comment on, on part of that. It's a huge question. It's a huge question that you could probably discuss for an entire hour. But uh, just a quick comment on data sets in general, publicly available data sets we're working with, data sets that come from different sources. It's always important that the data are labeled correctly and they often are not. And if we work with data sets that are labeled incorrectly, 
where your diagnosis, for example, is not correct or, or, or your, the, your detection or your segmentation or whatever you're, you're looking at is incorrect, you're going to have an incorrect algorithm. So be very aware of what data you're using and a lot of data and a lot of even huge initiatives, huge, 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 multi-million, billion dollar initiatives have failed because data were not labeled correctly. So just be, be aware. Thank you, Ken. Perhaps uh, Thomas, Marcus or Sven, do you have anything to add on this? I think no. that the data sharing aspect is in is is a really important one, and um, maybe also from the perspective of a hospital that's often portrayed as the hospitals are not willing to share the data. But I think there's also a significant risk to that. A lot of these data contain kind of like protected health information. That is also something in the US that's rather challenging to sometimes remove from these data sets to just make it available to somebody. I think that is that is the first part. So de-identifying data. And for this, I think we are still lacking on the data standardization side. So we need standardized metadata APIs to make that data accessible by other people in the world and do so securely. And I think the next problem is ultimately we want to associate that data with clinically relevant information. And that is sometimes very difficult to do without any like protected health information in there. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a huge problem, but it's not an easy one to solve. Um, and we need to find ways so that hospitals are able to share that data with other hospitals and other researchers in order to utilize them. And I think in the US, we have made a significant step towards this now with the uh, patient access rule as part of the 21st Century Cures Act, where patients have the right to access their data and use it for, for any purposes. Um, but there is also a gap between kind of like the rules and regulations for data sharing in the US and in Europe in particular, especially the differences between HIPAA and the, and the EDPR. So I think there's a lot kind of like where we also need help from regulators and, and lawmakers in making that exchange of data um, easier and, and allowing that uh, to make that available for researchers. I think this is a, a, a very important point, <laughs> especially uh, I think data sharing is, is really important, but we need to make sure how are we going to do that. And um, there needs to be more transparency of um, 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 regarding also the problems, even if you have de-identified data, um, if you have another data set available, you can potentially re-identify them these days. So I think there needs to be also more regulatory safeguards in place. Um, I think, like, I think we have one more question and then I will hand it over uh, uh, to the last um, comments. So in a number of projects for MRI and <clears throat> uh, CT scan data, in addition to HIPAA, my team has run um, into issues over proprietary format for the scan data. Uh, has anyone encountered work around this? That's a very specific question and it very much depends on, on what proprietary formats you've been running into. Uh, so it, it, it'll be difficult to give a generic answer to, to this one. Uh, but it's it's important. It's an, a very important point for for data data protection and also the different rules that that single institutions and countries have. But I can't give you a generic answer for for that question. Okay, so I think we are already running over our time. So I, I hand it over to um, uh, Joanne. Okay, thank you, Sarah. And thank you for preparing such excellent questions and, and to our distinguished speakers for your future oriented and thought provoking presentations. And of course, to my fellow organizers in Canada and the US um, and the participants, you have really thoughtful questions and um, we really appreciated that. We covered a lot of topics today from new advances in AI applications, democratizing medical knowledge and expertise, regulating aspects of AI, bias in AI, the importance of ethics in AI, human-centered AI, bridging the gap between research and practice, just to name a few. And we could organize a separate panel on each of these topics that, that, you know, that we, I just mentioned. Um, some of the audience members might have additional questions so feel free to share them with us um, and we'll forward them to the speakers. 
And again, we really appreciate your having joined us today. We look forward to seeing you at future panel discussions. And thank you again, speaker, to our speakers and moderator for your excellent comments and presentations. Um, thank you very much.